Okay, so today we will talk about uh, some elementary number theory. So, number theory really concerns properties of the set of integers. So, let us denote that set by uh, uh, z. So, this is the set of integers. So, recall this is just all numbers 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. Also, the negative integers. And uh, so, sometimes we will just restrict ourselves to the positive integers, it is it's not too important. So, the key property of integers that one studies or the very first property is the notion of divisibility. So, let us just define this formally. So, given two integers n and d, so given let us call it n and d integers, we say that d divides n. So, we say that uh, there are several different equivalent uh, ways of saying this. So, we say that let us call it n is divisible by d okay, if n is some multiple of d, if n can be written as q d for some integer q for some integer q. Okay. So, there are uh, other ways in which we express this. We also say that <coughs> if this happens, we often say d divides n or that n is a multiple of d. Okay. So, they are all just uh, other, other ways of expressing the same thing. So, let me just say also another common thing, commonly used expression is that d divides n. And uh, this of course, has a notation which is very convenient in many situations. So, this is the notation we write d divides n, divides just being this vertical line over here. So, that is the notation for uh, divisibility. So, what are examples? Of course, this is very familiar and easy. So, for instance, 3 divides 6 because 6 can be written as 3 times 2. 13 divides 52 because 52 is 13 times 4 and so on etcetera. So, you can think of a large number of such examples. It is also interesting to keep in mind uh, that you know these numbers could be negative here. For instance, we would say that 3 divides minus 6. Similarly, minus 3 also divides 6 for instance because minus 6 can be written as 3 times minus 2. And similarly, 6 here can be written as minus 3 times a minus 2. Okay. So, these are also perfectly valid ways of uh, they are also you know they also fit the definition of divisibility. Now, here is uh, you know here are some uh, border cases which we need to keep in mind uh, d no matter what d you pick always divides 0. Okay. So, d divides 0 for a, for every d for every d in z because 0 can always be written as d times 0. Right? So, 0 is a multiple of every number. Similarly, 1 divides every number n. So, 1 divides n for every n in z. Okay? So, every number is a multiple of 1 similarly because n can be written as 1 times n. Okay? So, these are uh, some sort of the as I said the borderline cases to keep in mind. Now, of course, we do not always have divisibility meaning every number does not divide every other number. So, a useful thing to keep in mind is the notion of division with remainder. So, I should call it division with remainder. So, what does this mean? Well, let us write it out formally first and then we will write out examples. Let n and d be integers and let us assume that d is positive. It is just a assumption for convenience. So, if d is positive, then there exist unique integers, then there exist unique integers 
call them q and r the quotient and the remainder such that n can be written as such that n can be written as q times d plus r and uh, the constraint on r the remainder is that it is a number between 0 and d minus 1. Okay. So, r is greater than equal to 0 and less than d. So, that is the condition. And recall this of course, very much resembles the, the, the notion of long division of polynomials that we talked about at the very end. In fact, these are really you can think of them as being uh, two instances of the same principle. Okay. So, this again uh, is the formal statement, but uh, I am sure the, the, the various examples are you know I, I am sure you have, you have seen this in examples. So, here are a few of them. So, if I take the number 52 for instance, that is n and we try to divide it by 10, that is the d. So, here is n and here is d. So, of course, it is not exactly divisible, but you can think of the quotient as being 5. So, that accounts for a 50 and a remainder of 2. So, that is the remainder here, that is r and the quotient is a 5. Okay. Similarly, if I take uh, it is 252 divided by let us say 13. So, I have the number 52, I try to divide it by the number 13 and in this case it divides exactly. So, it is 4 times 13 plus no remainder. So, think of remainder now as being 0. So, here the remainder is r is 0, quotient is 4. So, an alternate equivalent way of defining divisibility. So, you would say that d divides n if and only if the remainder is 0. Okay. So, that is a that is an equivalent way of stating the same thing. And here again negative numbers need to be treated a little more carefully. So, if for instance you try to divide the number minus 52. So, if that is your number n. So, now for convenience we have already assumed that d is positive. So, let me say I try to divide it by the number 10. So, that is my d. So, of course, you could still think of it as you know, sort of being like you know forgetting the minus sign for now. It is like dividing 52 by 10. So, if you think of say the quotient as being minus 5 in this case. Okay. So, there is a minus 5 and if you see what is left there is a minus 2 left. Okay, so, minus 52 is minus 5 times 10 plus a minus 2. So, you could be tempted to think of the quotient as minus 5 and the remainder as minus 2, but uh, that is not okay because we have at least in the way we stated it, we have required the remainder to be a number between 0 and d minus 1. Okay, so, the remainder has to be a number between 0 and 9, minus 2 is not allowed as a possibility. Okay, so, this is not quite going to serve our purpose. Instead, what we need to do is the following. We need to do something to get the remainder to be a positive number. So, we increase or well rather decrease the quotient. Okay, you change the quotient by 1, so as to obtain a positive remainder. So, here is an alternate way of writing the same thing. You can think of it as minus 6 times 10. So, that is minus 60 plus an 8. Okay, that is still a minus that is still a minus 52. And now, this is really the expression you want. So, you should think of the quotient as being minus 6 and the remainder as being 8. Okay. So, the remainder now of course, satisfies the, the constraint that we wanted to satisfy. Okay. So, that is about divisibility and division with remainder. So, very important class of numbers are what are called the prime numbers. So, what are the prime numbers? Well, an integer greater than 1. So, this is what you would call a natural number. So, before we talk of talk about prime numbers, let us recall the set of natural numbers n is just well all the positive integers. So, this is just 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on is what is called the set of natural numbers. So, a prime number is a natural number. So, a natural number p is said to be prime
if the following if firstly p has to be at least 2, so p strictly greater than 1 and further the only natural numbers that divide p are 1 and p and the only natural numbers okay so it has no other divisors other than 1 and itself okay so again i assume this must be familiar so what are the the list of prime numbers well at least we can write out the first few. So, we have 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19 that is the full list of prime numbers until 20, but then the list really goes on ok. So, it is uh, well there are in fact infinitely many prime numbers, <coughs> we will come back to that in a minute. <coughs> So, here are sort of two different ways of thinking about prime numbers. On the one hand, they do not really have divisors other than you know, 1 and itself. In other words, you cannot really break them down, <coughs> you cannot break them down into smaller numbers. So, you should think of So, here is uh, a picture of prime numbers that it is useful to keep in mind. If they did have factors, so any number which has a divisor can be written as you know product of smaller numbers, but since prime numbers do not have so you know divisors other than 1 and itself, you cannot really break them down any further and write them as a product of smaller numbers. So, that is one aspect of prime numbers, but there is sort of also a complementary aspect uh, which is that every number can always be written as a product of primes. Okay. So, this is another property if you wish of primes that every number can be broken down into primes or every natural number can be broken down into a product of primes. Okay, so, examples of the, the latter principle if you have the number 60, so this is 2 into 2 into 3 into 5, similarly 630 for instance would be 2 times 3 times 3, 5 times 7 and so on. Okay, so, this is often what we call the prime factorization that uh, an arbitrary number can always be written as a product of primes and further this expression really is unique ok. So, that is another important property of prime factorization. So, every number can be broken down into primes, but in an essentially unique fashion ok. So, further uniquely is another uh, important and interesting feature of this. Okay, so, for instance, the number 630, uh, if you wanted to write it down as a product of primes, the only sort of different looking expressions you can produce are things in which the primes are written in different orders. So, you could probably want to write 630 as maybe 7 times, 5 times, uh, 3 times, 3 times 2, maybe in descending order of primes or in some other arbitrary order. But other than that, there is not much you can do. You cannot uh, find another expression for 630, which say it does not involve these primes say for instance something which contains 13 as one of its factors ok. So, such things are not possible it is essentially uh, unique these expressions ok. So, up to up to reordering ok. So, uh, let us come back to this this property that I just mentioned that it is an infinite list. So, the list of prime numbers is infinite is uh, uh, a very famous statement which goes back all the way to Euclid. So, theorem due to Euclid says that there are infinitely many primes ok and the proof itself is 
rather interesting and, and, and illuminating it proceeds uh, through contradiction. So, let me just quickly sketch the proof Euclid's uh, first proof of this fact that there are infinitely many primes. So, it, it says the following suppose not, suppose not in other words there are only finitely many primes. So, let us give them names. So, let p 1, p 2, p d let us say be the full list of primes. Okay, so, you imagine for the moment that the list is finite and that is the full list and now what you do is the following you create uh, a number. So, you, you form the following number let n denote the product of all these primes p 1, p 2, p d, but with 1 added to it. Okay. So, you look at the number p 1, p 2, p d plus 1. So, that is some natural number which is well bigger than all the primes because it is in fact their it is bigger even than their product. And now, we do the following n of course, is some natural number and sort of by using the principle that every natural number has a prime factorization. Okay. So, let us write n. So, here is the let us break n down into prime. So, here is the prime factorization of n. So, we write n as let us say capital P 1 capital P 2 till let us call it capital P k where all the, the p i's are all primes. So, they could of course, be you know there could be repetitions when you write down prime factorizations as we just saw when we talked about 630 and 60 and so on. Uh, some of these could be could be repeating. So, that does not quite matter for us. So, let us write n in this fashion and let us do the following. Let us think of this as well two parts the the first p 1 let us isolate p 1 and let us think of the remaining as being another number p 2 p 3 till p k. Uh, let us call that as q. Okay. So, this part is q the second number and p 1 remember is the is the very first factor in this expression is a prime right. So, p 1 after all is a prime it occurs in the prime factorization. So, p 1 being prime must occur in the list of primes, must occur in the full list of primes that we wrote out, must occur in the list of primes. In other words, it is some p i. Okay. In other words, p 1 has to be somewhere in the list. Let us call it p i for some i between 1 and d. So, for some i between 1 and d. So, let us call p 1 as the prime p i. So, here is what we conclude that this number n is in fact of the form p i times q. In other words, it is a multiple of that prime p i. Now, on the other hand n we knew what n was it is p 1, p 2, p d. So, remember in this list p i also appears. So, this is p i will occur somewhere in the middle plus a 1. So, here are two different expressions for the same number n but they are mutually contradictory. Okay. So, these two expressions cannot both be true at the same time and why is that? Well, to see it what we will do is we will move this all these terms over to the left hand side. Okay. So, this equality provides us the following uh, equivalent reformulation p i times. So, I will keep the q as it is and I will subtract you know I will move this term over to the left. So, and, and I am pulling out a p i common. So, this is now p 1, p 2, p d, but in which p i is missing. Okay. So, p i has now been pulled out. So, this p i term here I will put a hat on top to say that you should think of that term as being missing from this expression. So, it is p i times q minus the product of the other p i's is the number 1. Okay. So, that is the conclusion we make finally. But observe that is clearly not possible okay, because the left hand side is a multiple of the prime p i, it is p i times some number whereas, the right hand side is a number 1 okay. and a prime of course, is a number which is 2 or more. So, there is no way that a, multi a number that is bigger than 2 can multiply something out to give you the number 1. Okay. So, this final expression here is a contradiction. 
and that in fact proves that our initial assumption was wrong that the list of primes is finite. Okay? So, that is really uh, Euclid's rather uh, ingenious proof that the number of primes is in fact fine, is infinite and since then of course, there have been several different proofs using several different ideas. Okay? So, next time we will talk about uh, a little bit more that one can do with division with remainder and primes and so on.